guys up. So first off, I'm going to bring up uh, Mardon, Mardon from Endless West. Um, Mardon, why don't you give two seconds on what Endless West does and how you kind of came to this, and then I'll, and I'll bring up Jared. Sure. Endless West, uh, we're a spirits and tech company, and we make wine and spirits uh, molecularly. What that means is we analyze the molecular profile of, for example, a whiskey. What makes it a whiskey? We source those ingredients elsewhere in nature from other fruits or vegetables, and we put it all back together from scratch uh, and build it. Uh, within a day. So there's no aging or barreling or any of that involved. It's down on formula. Cool. Uh, so we're going to bring up Jarrett here. Jarrett is from Atoma Coffee. And what, obviously in the name, what are you rethinking, Jarrett, <laughs> in terms of food products? Uh, so yeah, Jarrett Stopforth, uh, co-founder, chief scientist at Atoma Coffee. Um, you know, when we think of uh, molecular, what, what we're thinking is, right, there's basal building blocks um, for any food out there and beverage for that matter. And what we did was, uh, you know, we looked at what makes coffee? What is coffee, right? So we drink a lot of coffee at, uh, <laughs> at the co-founders, my, my co-founder Andy, we drink a lot of coffee and, uh, you know, we love coffee. It's not that we uh, hate coffee and we're here to break it, but the real thing about it is that, you know, we're finding great inconsistencies in coffee and we just took another look at it and said, there's gotta be a way that we can design consistently great coffee that's also better for the environment. Uh, and uh, that was the uh, start of our journey, right? This started in my garage, started spinning coffee uh, from a molecule up, and you know, maybe as we go through this discussion, we'll get more into the how on that. Yeah, so Mardon, let's, uh, let's do the same thing that we just did with Jared, which is like the origin story of your company and you and Alec getting together and saying like, we're gonna make whiskey and wine, right? I mean, you're not just making whiskey, you're doing a lot of different yep. cool stuff in your labs. Um, how did that come about and why did you decide to kind of dedicate your, the rest of your career for now, at least into making molecular whiskey? Sure, so this started about three, four years ago, closer to four, uh, it was a weekend. I had friends from out of town come visit. Um, at the time, I'd been working in a lab in San Francisco, and I took him on a wine tour around Napa and Sonoma, um, basically the wine region in, uh, in California. And the last vineyard that the tour guide took us was the Cricket Shells Estate. And so this was a famous vineyard, a uh, famous winemaker, and on the wall, they had a bottle of Montalena 73. So this was a wine that won the Judgment of Paris in 76. So this American wine was famous because it beat all other French wines at the time where New World wines, meaning for the most part non-French wines, were seen mostly as a joke or non-competitive. Um, but this was a big deal. A lot of the judges retracted their scores and it was a big controversy and a lot of people say this wine put America on the map. Um, so I obviously wanted to try it, but it was $12,000 and there was less than 10 bottles left. Uh, at least that's what the employee told me. Uh, and so you I just left. stick it in your bag and walk out. <laughs> it was behind a plexiglass, so I couldn't. I would have to like take Old it. Mission from... Impossible theft scene going on yeah. here. I could see that happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my brain started. The gears started turning. Um, I have a background in biotech and molecular biomechanics. Can I make wine in a different way to come up with the same product uh, in the laboratory instead? And so the next day I came to work, I told Alec, my co-founder, about it, and he said it's had the best idea, the worst idea he's ever heard. I said, great, I think, I think it's, it's worth a shot. So it was a weekend project for a few months. Um, it turned into a weeknight project, and then it just kind of took a life on its own. Uh, first few articles about us came out and just kind of exploded, and we decided to, to take it on full time. Awesome. And, and Jarrett, you actually came from the food world, so you have a background in food science and you had worked at a number of different food companies. So uh, tell me how that kind of transitioned from being, well, I'm going to make food in the traditional way, you know, putting slamming ingredients together to now slamming molecules or understanding the molecules and then building it that, that way up. Yeah, um, so uh, I have my doctorate in uh, food science and microbiology and uh, I've been in the CPG space for over 20 years, innovating, creating product development, manufacturing. And the way I look at things is I always think to myself, there's got to be a way to do things better. There's got to be a way to uh, be able to break things down and put them back together. Uh, kind of like when you broke toys down as a kid, right? Like I just do that for food. And, uh, you know, it was one of these trips that I was on that I really wanted a good cup of coffee and I just couldn't get it. I got over roasted. I got really bad coffee. And, uh, you know, I just thought to myself, there has to be a better way. I've got to be able to do this. And so uh, I started doing a ton of research on it and uh, then started investing uh, 
my kids' college fund into a analytics. <laughs> um, uh, no joke. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, just mapping out the coffee bean, right, it, all the way from green to roasted to extracted uh, to try and understand what makes up coffee, right? And uh, it, it was a lot of work, and we did a lot of iterations in which uh, basically we made a lot of stuff that we just spat out for months upon end uh, until one day we discovered coffee, and it, it wasn't good coffee. It was, this is the direction of coffee. Um, and at about the same time, uh, one of my dear family friends, uh, who is a tech startup guy for 25 years, was looking for his next startup. And uh, we sat down, ironically, over coffee, and um, he said, what are you working on and, uh, that you want to do full time? And I told him about um, this, this coffee idea, right, hacking the bean. And uh, he looked at me and said, man, you're blowing my mind. Like, why would you ever do that? And uh, I explained it to him. He went off. He did his own research. He came back. He understood the crisis that coffee is truly in. And uh, one, one of uh, his mandates for his next company was to do something that was better, better for the environment, better for people. And uh, he said, hey, I'm in, man. Let's do this. And uh, we started spinning some more. And uh, we got to a point where we felt like we had coffee. And uh, we launched Kickstarter. And uh, the point there was to prove that people would actually buy it, right? So one of the things that we wanted to say is, like, people will actually buy this, right? Because the questions we always get is, like, why? What's in it? And will anybody buy it? So you did a Kickstarter before you had a product formulation, or you had an idea in a product formulation, and then you're like, oh, well, let's go see if we can sell this little batch that we did and stuff like that. Yeah, we had a raw formulation. I mean, it was something that like, could pass for coffee, right? So like, OK, we can do this. Yeah, and so people show up, and you're like, oh, crap, now we have to make it. <laughs> we right. have to make more of it and make it better, right? right. So it's a motivator right. more than you had ready to fulfill kind of a yeah, Kickstarter yeah. campaign kind of thing. Yeah, we, we basically formed the company, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they formed the form the company to take the Kickstarter check, basically, is what right. you're telling us right, right now. Right, right. So, little scuttlebutt, some companies will do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Mardan, I, I like how you transition into the why. Why the hell would you go at recreating Montalina 73? Montalina 73 is a beautiful thing. You should pay 12, what was it, 1200 $12,000 $12, a bottle, you yeah, know, for those things. Why the hell would you go about doing this? Is it about democratizing the access to these things? Is it about in the environment? Like, what are the, the real deep reasons behind doing it? Yeah, that? so, you know, the initial justification's quite different and has evolved a lot over, over the years. But initially, it's, it's this idea of, like you said, democratizing luxury products, luxury foods, and luxury beverages. Uh, this idea that this is supposed to be one of the best wines out there in the world, but nobody can really taste it anymore, didn't seem um, appetizing or appealing to me at all. Uh, if, if, if I found something that was the best at its category, I would want to share with as many people as possible and talk about it. Um, so there was, there was sort of a, a weird barrier that was built in front of this product, and, and I kind of wanted to take it down. So. You know, in some parts, it's it's this uh, notion of kind of being an iconoclast. How do we how do we break things apart and build it so that it's better than what it was previously? Um, taking something that's very traditional um, and creating something new about it. Uh, and you know, the idea of of tradition, things that are traditional, have always been born from something that was rebellious uh, to begin with. Um, and if you look at the whole process, you know, if you break it down molecularly, any food or beverage, um, well, for us, for whiskey, it turns out that it is a complex R&D process. It takes a lot of capital um, and, and hours to, to go about developing methods and sourcing of different ingredients and extractions and formulations and sensory. But in the end, it's still cost, more cost effective. Uh, it's a lot less resource intensive than traditional ways of doing uh, making these beverages, for example, in wine, we use 96% less water, 70% uh, less CO2 emissions in the product. Um, and so it started making a lot more sense about doing things this way. Um, one, of, one of my friends actually told me, um, you know, if wine is a process, then you may not be wine, but if wine is a product, then you're wine. So that's a really uh, a key learning that I've come across over the years. But, but isn't what you're doing, and I'm going I'm to be a little controversial on this, sure. isn't what you're doing the same thing that the Chinese knockoffs are doing to Louis Vuitton, like by making a knockoff bag and stuff like that and trying to pass themselves off as a luxury product, but at a lower price point? Like, where does it become um, homage and when does it become cheapening, right, a, a, a high-quality product and stuff like that? 
Yeah, so one key difference there is they actually started with, with a cheap wine and they adulterate it to make it more palatable. In some cases, they don't um, adulterate it at all. They just slap uh, like a um, counterfeit label on it and say, this is the wine. For us, it's how do we make a high quality product that would otherwise cost, for example, 12000 or $250 and make it cost $35? And how do we make that product consistent with every batch, with every production. So Jared, what's wrong with traditional coffee? Why is it you have to upend this industry, man? The bean. The bean. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with the bean? It's a good bean. Yeah, let's talk about the bean. So the bean is the problem. I mean, first off, the bean is an amazing incubator, right? Um, when you've studied it enough, and uh, we've done so in uh, just roughly over a year that we've been doing it, when you study it enough, you'll understand the bean is, it's an amazing incubator of both flavor and reaction. Uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable what the bean can do. But the one thing that's important to know is that when I said the bean is the problem, it truly is. The bean is the problem to inconsistent coffee. The bean is the problem to deforestation. The bean is the problem to unfair practices. The bean is the problem for a number of different reasons, right? And I can go on. We uh, create the demand for that bean because we love it, right? We all are a big percentage of us start our morning with it. Some of us do it you know, in the middle of the afternoon. We consume a lot of coffee. Um, roughly 27 million acres planted out there. Uh, 37 gallons per eight ounce cup of coffee. I mean, it's, it's intense. It's intense to strip the, the berry off of uh, you know, the bean and, and to get to where we want. 25 steps of supply chain handling. The bean's a problem, and the bean won't necessarily be around forever. Okay, so Andrea Illy goes on record, right? This is a guy who owns a fantastic coffee brand. Uh, and he goes on record saying, in 30 years from now, 50% of the crops will need to be moved. 50% of the plantations will need to be moved. That's a big deal. There's not a whole lot of place for it to go. And why is that? A couple different reasons, right? So, so global warming, right, uh, despite some people's belief in it not being real, is real. Um, and what's happening is the climate warms up in these regions. Coffee ripens faster. And what that causes them to do is the farmers now have to find new land to go, and they're going uphill in a practice called um, you know, uphill farming. And they are basically looking for new land to go and plant. Uh, and what they're doing is they're deforesting some more. And the more you deforest, the more it's impacting global warming. There's leaf rust that's out there. It's destroying uh, the plants. So coffee is facing increased demand, not demand for just coffee, demand for high quality coffee, right? Arabica, which has its own set of growing uh, requirements relative to Robusta, robust, right? It, it just grows under more conditions. Uh, and the point being is that we're in a cyclical disease, if you would, of deforesting to plant more, which creates more warmth, which creates more need, which creates worse coffee. And at the end of it, uh, you know, coffee is either going to be a real premium uh, or it's just not going to be available at the high quality that we expect it to be. So you're saying our $6 latte that we already buy is probably going to become $8, $10 after time because the demand is continuing to rise and the supply is getting harder and harder to make. And so we've got going to have a real gap there. Yeah, very likely. Um, and, and you're going to suffer quality too, right? It's not just that you're going to uh, have, have an issue paying for it. Like you're going to have an issue paying for struggling quality. Um, so I, I think it's really important. And I think one of the things to realize is it's tough to see that now, right? But the future is upon us. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was joking with somebody at lunch. I said, hey, remember that time when we spoke about like hovercrafts and like, you know, self-driving vehicles and we all laughed at it? Well, it's here. So uh, the same way I look at the future of ag tech, it's here, it's upon us. And there's going to be a need for it. So we've established there's a need for this new type of food creation um, to, to simulate these products that we love and make them higher quality and make a new product. I mean, I think in some ways, Mardon, you're making a new whiskey. You're not trying to copy people. You're trying to make something that just tastes good and that whiskey drinkers will appreciate, right? Exactly. Um, so we're not here to replace an existing product um, or to bulldoze existing whiskeys. Uh, you know, we see ourselves as you know, going hand in hand with them. Um, this is just a new art form for us. We're creating the new tools, much like how, you know, there's electronic music that's come about that's enabled more people to create music and create new forms of music. Uh, I think we see ourselves sort of in a similar vein. 
So that's a great segue into how is this done? And so we're talking a lot about like, there's this new food product, it's really cool, we've created it from the esters and the, and the elements up, but what does it actually take to make this? So like Mardon, what are you starting with as raw ingredients and, and, and the starting point for your product? And then how do you uh, adapt or, you know, again, paint that canvas? Like how do you figure out what colors to use? Sure. So the easiest way to think about it is if you imagine the nutritional label at the back of, let's say, a, a, an orange juice in the, in the grocery, uh, you'll see sugars, you'll see acids, you'll see um, maybe for a specific product, lipids, maybe some proteins. Um, so what we do is we go a level deeper than that. What are the actual sugars? What are the actual lipids? What are the actual proteins? What are the actual acids? What are the actual esters um, and flavor compounds present in that product? Um, and it's and we go and we go a step further and say, okay, let's use mass spec um, to identify all these compounds in an existing product. But you know, we're sure not all of those compounds are necessary or have a positive impact to the final product. And so what we do is have a filter that we go through to narrow it down to really what's just critical to that product. And so this is also part of the process that enables us to create a final product that, that's much more environmentally friendly and cheaper than a traditional counterpart. And are, so you, are you using a, a base neutral spirit then to build this flavor profile on top of? And so like, um, I think we want to demystify the fact that this is like, yeah. this is like crazy science going on back there. No, it's really how food has been built for many, many years, right? Is you taking compounds. And so like, uh, sorry to demystify this, the impossible burger and the Beyond Meat just doesn't come off a plant like that, right? So there's a lot of work that goes into making food food. Yeah. And so like, I, I want to demystify that for people. I want people to understand like, this is how food has always been made. It's just now we're, we're taking a level deeper with mass spec and ways of studying the compounds that we're actually getting to our tongue and our gut, right? Yeah, so if we think about alcohol, the main component of, of the alcohol in any um, alcoholic beverage is ethanol. So you know, for us, it's where do we get the cheapest, the cleanest, the most neutral source of neutral grain spirit, of neutral ethanol. Um, and there's only so many crops out there that you could find that can do this. And I think it's, it's sort of obvious without me explicitly saying which crop it is. And how about for the coffee? So how do you actually build the coffee product without the bean? Like where does it start and what are the compounds and things like that that you've kind of decided? Like is there any new or novel things that you've found like, holy crap, this tastes a lot like you know, the coffee thing that we like. Because I think people are probably familiar with like mushrooms as a replacement for coffee kind of thing. But it doesn't have that same flavor. It doesn't have that same depth. Like how do you create your flavor and depth? Yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, you, I'm going to touch on the last point of mushroom coffee. You've seen mushroom coffee. You've seen chicory coffee. Um, uh, these are coffee alternatives. Uh, you know, the way to think about it is we're creating coffee without the bean. People say, hey, is this synthetic coffee? Is this a uh, fake coffee? I'm like, no, it's coffee without the bean. Simply that. We're not using the bean as a starting point, but it is in no way, form, or shape a trade-off from your conventional type of coffee in taste or experience. That's an important piece to know, right? Because acorn coffee and uh, mushroom coffee do not taste like coffee. Uh, we don't want to change the way people perceive this. We don't want to change your ritual. We don't want to change your day. We want to give you a choice, the first choice. Uh, think of it as the Tesla of coffee, right? Before Tesla came along, we didn't have a choice. We had diesel and we had gas. Today, when we look at it, we have the first choice of coffee without the bean, the sustainable, the clean way, right? So um, uh, to build on what Mardon was saying is we, we look at coffee in what we call the big five. We break it up into aroma, flavor, body or texture, color, and bioactives. Um, when we talk about bioactives, right, we're talking about caffeine, uh, we're talking about the polyphenols, antioxidants. Uh, the thing that makes coffee good. Decaf yeah. coffee is not coffee. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, exactly. So, uh, well, to that point, we can build the world's first truly decaf coffee That's by true. not putting it in. If in people the don't place. know this, most decaf coffees still have caffeine. It's not truly no. caffeine free. No, exactly. So, so our no calf coffee could be the first one that actually you drink, you know, a few minutes before you go to bed. Um, but the way that we're looking at it is in a very similar way. We've taken the coffee bean and we've broken them down into compounds, and we've mapped those compounds. Then we've gone and we've added them back, right? We've added them back as, as uh, individuals to try and build something. And this is one of those things where, 
you know, the sum of the parts does not equal the whole. You don't just take a bunch of things and add them together. Remember I spoke about the bean and it being an incubator? Reactions happen inside there. It's not just molecules that, that you add and suddenly you have coffee. There's reactions going on there. So some of the IP that we're working on is we're building reactions, okay? We're building reactions of compounds that generate what you come to perceive as aroma, as flavor, as mouthfeel. Because at the end of the day, we have tried to build it individual component-wise, and it is not coffee. So yeah, doing that in the traditional food way of finding the ingredients, just mashing them up and kind of pressing out a product doesn't work. You have to do a little bit of manipulation. And so that brings me to my next question, which is, and this is for all those traditional food lovers out there, is it organic? Is it non-GMO? Because the U.S. world is going the organic, non-GMO, traditionally grown, grass-fed, you know, uh, name, name your label and stuff like that. That's where the U.S. consumer mind is going. So could your product be considered non-GMO and organic? I don't know that I care for it to be considered that. So, Why not? Um, well, this is a personal opinion, okay? Um, I don't think organic is a choice of ours. I don't think it is a value of ours. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of uh, great brands who've generated great products, organic products, uh, and uh, in specific niche markets or not. And, and my view of that is, is if we convinced everybody that that is great, organic is great, we truly couldn't actually feed everybody with that product. There's just not enough of it out there. So who truly cares? From my standpoint, this is a personal opinion, because you actually couldn't sustainably make organic for all. Okay, so it just simply doesn't have the same supply base out there. Uh, for me, I also need to understand what value props organic brings, right? Uh, there's debates on both sides of uh, the line, but I can tell you there's a lot more that goes into organic without perceived nutrition and or functional benefit. Okay, so that's, that's a personal opinion. Non-GMO, we feed the world with GMO. Again, if, if we had to deviate from it, I don't know that it would have any value for me, and that's a personal opinion, okay? So um, I respect all opinions on that, but yeah, I mean, ours is not necessarily GMO, uh, the ingredients that we use, um, but uh, I don't have a good feel for having to use non-GMO. So Mardon, I'm going to grab your bottle here because we got it sitting here, and I'm going to look for those labels, but you tell me, is this non-GMO organic, and do you care if it's labeled that way? It's not certified. Yeah. Um, is there anything stopping I, you from be, being non-GMO and organic? I just don't think it, I, I think it's sort of in some ways a false uh, pandering to the audience. Um, so for us, this is a pursuit of objectiveness. How do we create a product that's true to its form uh, without compromise or without um, bending the truth uh, uh, per se? I think I take the question from a you know, practical point of view. Um, people say organic, people say non-GMO as a means of saying it's a healthier food and that it's something that um, they can grow in their backyard and, and feed their families in a more sustainable way. Um, but if you take, you know, take the whole population of, of the planet as a whole, like Jared said, I don't think it's the more, most efficient way of doing things. Um, you know, I think conventional methods um, that's still better, and I think that's proven. I think improving those methods um, is the way to go. Um, and it, it, it comes down to you know, answering the question, what's the most efficient way of doing things? And I don't think uh, organic is. So I think the proof is in the pudding with any food product. I think it's been talked about here at the show a lot, which is it has to taste damn good. Right, so both of you guys have had this in the hands of consumers in some way, shape, or form. So what is the consumer response? And I'll start with you, Jared, because I think you're on a much smaller scale right now today, you know, hopefully not so much in the future, but how many people have touched, tasted, you know, the Atomo coffee, and what's been the response? Yeah, thank you. The, uh, so we're uh, clearly not commercialized in any market like uh, Glyph uh, from Endless West. Uh, you know, we're uh, less than a year into this, but uh, we're making great traction, and we will be. Yes, we've had uh, hundreds of folks taste this. Um, actually, this morning, I, uh, I had to break away from the show for a two-and-a-half-hour filming event in the lab. We had a, a British film crew in there to kind of film how we spin it with some level of opacity, of course. Um, and uh, we, what we've done is everybody who comes in to taste it and, and all these tastings that we've done, we went to the U University of Washington, and we did a Pepsi challenge there against a big brand from Seattle. And... Uh, the, the, one, the one thing that we hear resoundingly is, 
we love the ultra smooth taste from your coffee, right? So that was also something that we attempted to do. 70% of folks who drink coffee drink it with cream and sugar. There's a reason for it, right? Like people say, I love coffee. And it's like, no, you love the result of coffee, not the taste, because we put a lot of stuff into it. Uh, and that's because people just don't like bitter and sour. And I say generally, right? I mean, there's clearly 30% who love it. Um, but the one thing that we've heard is that it's, it's smooth. And people say, I could drink this without cream or sugar. And I love the taste. And I love the fact. Now, we could build in bitterness and acidity. And we could build in this third wave uh, feel. Um, and that's an aim. We, we aim to create a line of them. But our launch is going to be a smooth cup of coffee so that we can actually con convert even non-coffee drinkers into drinking it. So your market that you're targeting is coffee for people that are not satisfied with existing coffee. So the stuff that comes out of our friends here in Seattle from Starbucks and McDonald's and all the other coffee breweries, you want to provide a, a higher quality experience for less price? Or like, what's the, other va what's the value proposition you're trying to sell to those consumers other than taste, obviously? Yeah, so the, I mean, there's a number of huge value props, at least uh, the way that we see it is uh, the future of coffee, right? We're going to be the future of coffee. When coffee's dead, we'll be there. Um, but more so, uh, we're going to give you coffee that uh, is better for the environment, has a higher sustainability play, can be more consistent. That's, the, that's a very important piece, is consistently great. Okay? And with scale, it will be cheaper. So we will be pitching premium coffee at a lower cost than your standard coffee today. Have you had, was it Q tasters come in and taste your coffee? Yeah, we actually, uh, so, so a number of the team have gone. Explain what Q tasters are first for people that aren't familiar with the coffee Yeah, industry. so I mean, it's, it's the next level of, uh, so, so in order to become a, a Q grader and, and, and taster, you've got to go through a uh, pretty rigorous set of being able to pull out uh, taste from coffee, being able to uh, march different coffees, being able to identify regions. Uh, and so they're probably the highest level of uh, sophisticated palate when it comes to coffee. And uh, you know, a number of our team have gone through and become certified roasters and uh, uh, tasters. And so uh, for us, it's important. Because remember, one of the things I said up front here, we're not here to replace coffee. We think coffee's great. We, we think it has some issues. We want to improve it. We want to be consistently great. We, uh, and we want to we provide a choice. But we need to understand coffee first, right? And so that's one of the things that we find very important. And so yes, we've had it up. And uh, we've got some great feedback on it. Clearly, when you're a Q taster and a Q grader, you have uh, uh, an expectation uh, of coffee. And so they become your toughest critics. But that's great, too, for us. Yeah. And so, Mardon, everybody's a critic when it comes to liquor, right? Because a lot of people you know, think that they're experts in this space. So how is your customer response? So first off, talk about how many stores you're in right now, stores and, and food service operations. Here yeah, at we're close to 250 stores in the United States. Uh, most of that is in California and New York City. Um, the response has been mostly positive. Um, you know, with a new product like this, it kind of questions a lot of the traditional values that hardcore whiskey drinkers have. Uh, and so that curiosity just kind of pushes them to try the product. And for the most part, a lot of them are surprised by it. Um, the common sentiment is this is unlike any whiskey I've tried before. Um, not to say that it isn't a whiskey, but it's a whole new flavor, which is good for us because we're not trying to copy any specific brand. We want to make our own. Um, but also make it friendly and recognizable to the general public. Uh, so we, you know, this was very intentional on our part, uh, selecting this specific formula. Actually, we call this 85H, which is formula 1,300 plus. Um, so we had to taste and smell through all these formulas, and this is the one that we ended up liking and testing the best with, with the consumers. Uh, so this is a lot smoother than commercial whiskeys out there which is a positive, uh, and also reminiscent more of the Japanese and maybe Canadian style whiskeys, so friendly. Is it, and is it made for the whiskey lovers, like the hardcore people like me, or is it made for the average everyday whiskey person that's afraid of whiskey? Like, how do you think about your consumer and why, and how you're designing? Because I assume that the consumer and the yeah. design kind of has to go back and forth, right? It's like... Yeah. Um, so it turns out, you know, hardcore... The prototypical hardcore whiskey would be something that's very peaty, uh, with a lot of earthiness and muskiness and leather notes. But that only represents about 13, 8 to 13 percent of the population of whiskey drinkers. So a large percentage, 37 percent uh, and above, actually prefer the style that we've gone with. 
So you're more whiskey for everybody else rather than the hardcore people. So the hardcore people yeah. are still going to grab their, yep. you know, whatever, Lagavulin in 16 yep. or whatever, or their, God, if you have it, Pappy, and if you have Pappy, invite me over. Um, <laughs> so you're, they're going to go for that, but yours is for everybody else for now. And, and you'll come up with new, I assume you're coming out with new varieties and new types and things like that. You're experimenting. Like yeah. you said, how many, how many different experimentations have you gone through again? Uh, for this specific whiskey, 1,300. 1,300 experiments. And so like yeah. some in there, they're probably good for other people, but it's exactly. just like it didn't pass your, pass your quality test for this exactly. one you wanted to launch. We wanted the first product to be very welcoming. Yeah. So talk about some of the other things that you've been working on, because I think it's very interesting, the evolution that you guys got going to whiskey. And so you didn't just do whiskey. You had started off with other things, trying other beverages in your, in your lab and stuff like that. So talk about some of that. I mean, like, I always love the failures. Right? Talk about some of the failures where you're like, oh, God, this tastes awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the first piece written about us was when we were still working on wine, uh, and we started, so this is way back, uh, just the three of us founders, um, we created much like a Kickstarter, uh, kind of a landing page just to see if people would be open to this idea. So I created three quick uh, web pages with different names, and I said, here's synthetic wine, pre-order it. Just an image of a wine bottle, some ingredients, and the button that says pre-order. And in about a week and a half, we got $30,000. Um, we didn't collect any of the money. It was just credit card sign-ups. Uh, but that was a good enough motivator for us. Um, and actually, back then, the way it was worded was, it was we were cloning a champagne, which obviously brought to us a lot of, kind of legal challenges. Uh, we ultimately didn't go down that path. Champagne's a term that is <laughs> legislated by the French, and you don't exactly. ever want to get on the bad side of the French when yeah. it comes to legal matters. <laughs> yeah, we found that out pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> so we decided along the way that the product was closer to a, a white dessert wine, and we said, you know, let's, let's go with this and let's see where we end up with. So we actually finished and were very satisfied with um, Moscato di Asti, two and a half years ago. Um, but the le for mostly legal reasons um, in the United States, it was unclear and it was very vague what the product could be called and what it could be legislated as. And so we decided to shelve that. We didn't want to go down a bureaucratic hole for a year or two. And we decided to pursue another side project, which was the whiskey. Uh, and that took a life of its own, developed very quickly. Uh, Regulatory-wise, it was a lot easier than wine. Uh, and so it was released in November of last year. Yeah, so lots of twists and turns to building a startup. So Jared, this brings up an interesting question. How the hell can you get away calling your thing coffee? And so we're already going through this with the dairy industry and them trying to you know, make sure that milk is milk and it comes from a cow. And the meat industry is meat has to come from, yet again, a cow. Um, like, why are you going to be able to go out to market and call this thing coffee in the big coffee industry? I don't know who the big bad guy is there. Maybe Starbucks. I don't know. How are they not going to stop you from calling it coffee? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, right? And it's not, it's not something that we haven't considered. Um, coffee has no standard of identity by FDA. So, yeah, I think uh, precedence has been set that coffee can be tagged to uh, uh, a number of different things that aren't traditionally from a coffee bean. Um, and so... Our position on this is we are coffee without the bean. Uh, depending on how much energy we want to put into fighting any sort of uh, action from uh, the, the larger companies will depend on it. But uh, there's, there's a number of different ways that this product can be called without even uh, saying coffee. I mean, uh, We'll see what this. We'll we'll see what the roadmap looks like. And Mardon, did the did did the big baddies from Jack Daniels come down and say you can't call this whiskey? Have you run into any issues with calling this thing whiskey yet? There's been a few few cases, but not as uh, drastic as I thought it would be. Um, I think for the most part, there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of over time, a lot of openness to what the tech could do for them as well. Uh, cool. So uh, a couple more questions, and we'll open it up. Yeah, just give us one or two more. Minutes here for a second. Just we got two more questions finished, and then and I'll open it up. Um, so uh, one question is about scaling. And so one of the things is the traditional industries have already built this thing at scale, whether it be coffee or whiskey at scale has been done and, and experimented. You guys are doing something new. And so what is it going to take for you guys for molecular food to actually scale? What do you need in terms of resources, capital, talent, 
technique, technology, what is missing from this to scale this thing up to be big? So I'll start with you, Jared, since you're earlier on and like, you know, beginning the journey roughly, you know, you've, you've been doing it for a while. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that you look at whenever you're looking at building a company and uh, a food company for that matter, um, it, there's resource requirements regardless, right? So you, you, you have raw materials that you have to start with and there's, there's got to be um, sufficient capacity for uh, the supply chain. Um, we have done a, a lot of work on ensuring that we have the ability to scale this, uh, whether you know it grows slowly or grows fast, and ensuring that the parameters that we put in place uh, still hold true to uh, the values and uh, you know the core that we put around it from a sustainability standpoint, so that we are actually doing better for the environment, right? So that we maintain sustainability indices and that we continue to. Uh, hold up a banner. Um, so we've we've done our due diligence on that. Um, the other piece of that is naturally having uh, the ability to manufacture it while still maintaining uh, IP, and uh, that is either building out our own facility or finding a way to build the ingredient, the basal ingredients, uh, call it the magic sauce, if you will, that can go into a co-packing environment. So these are the evaluations we're doing. Great, and Mardon, real quickly, last comment on how do you scale your business? Sure. So we do everything in-house, um, and for the most part, I would say it's a lot, actually a lot more straightforward than traditional ways of, of manufacturing these goods because the components are well-defined. They're a lot more pure. Um, they're not raw or crude ingredients. Um, and also, if you think about it, if it's down a formula, it's a lot more consistent. We're not um, beholden to harvest seasons. We can make exactly to demand. So we don't hold a lot of inventory at all. Um, and also, you know, um, QC, because of the, the methods that we develop for analytical also apply for QC, it's easily ported over. Um, Production-wise, Whereas a typical producer, uh, distiller, winery would need, um, would use a small scale operation um, to produce, let's say, 50,000 bottles. We could use the same setup, again, because we're not beholden to harvest seasons for a 250,000, 500,000 bottle uh, capacity. That's great. Well, thank you guys. Um, any questions? I think we're going to need to wrap up pretty quickly here, but um, I'll, we'll take a couple of questions just from the audience. I think we got some interested people. Uh, hi, I'm Hiromi, so from Japan. So, uh, so when I had the word of molecular food uh, at first, so I remember the popular book uh, titled Modernist Cuisine. Uh, it's uh, written by uh, Nathan Miyamoto, the former um, Microsoft CTO. So, yeah, uh, my curiosity is uh, who inspired to yours to bring this area? It's my question. So who inspired you? Um, well, there was no one figure for me to get it started. It was this idea that I couldn't, again, for the origins, from the origin story, that I couldn't afford this bottle of wine that had this amazing um, story behind it. And so I wanted to create it myself instead. So it was a very personal uh, motivation. Yeah, I mean, I think there's personal motivations for us all, right? I wanted consistently great coffee, and I wanted to make sure that there was a sustainable way to do it. Um, I will say that there's a number of different uh, companies that we look towards as North Stars, right? Um, uh, Tom's, Patagonia, ones that we've mapped our values to as we've moved forward, and that is uh, ensuring that there's a way to give back and also uh, continue um, the cycle of paying it forward. So that's, uh, that's uh, some of our motivations, but uh, the actual inspiration for it is wanting consistently great coffee that also feels good to drink because you're doing great by the environment. All right, so uh, you guys uh, uh, mentioned about it. Uh, you guys are really great at making uh, something from the ingredients, like something raw materials, and put it in like a coffee-like or whiskey-like uh, 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 products. But uh, look, when you actually try to make the good one, right, the good quality, and do you guys actually try to quantify what the good quality is? Like, for example, you said like uh, whiskey has to be smooth. Is it like something like you actually go into like a viscosity of the liquid and then try to uh, match that number, or is it actually more like qualitative, like a surveying it and then ask people, is it look that good or <laughs> what is it? Well, we build our tech so that it's as quantitative and objective as, as possible, but there's still this objective part. There's still a sensory part behind it, right? Uh, people's tastes still dictate a lot of what product rolls out of the market, but I think this concept of 
um, molecular food is down to methods that can identify and quantify. Yeah, yeah and, and I'll build on that just a little bit. I mean, uh, the methods are defined. You know, uh, we spoke about Q graders, we spoke about Q tasters. Um, there, there are specific things that coffee are measured towards and, and, and how you actually cup and experience it, and we do those daily. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's the analytical piece to it. But at the, at the end of the day, I mean, we have some north stars that we track towards, and we apply the techniques that are commonly used in the industry so that we're not deviating from a consumer's expectation. Uh, in addition to that, we use a voice of the enthusiast panels. So, uh, you know, we, we go to the public. We have an independent third party assimilate uh, the enthusiasts, if you will, people who'd give us objective feedback without knowing us personally or what our journey is, so that we understand really what the consumer is looking for and how they're evaluating products. Right here. Hey, Jared, this question for you. I'm um, just curious, uh, for coffee, the ritual is very important to a lot of drinkers, and so they're used to kind of the whole brewing process with pour over or making a coffee maker. Like, what's the form of the coffee, not coffee, um, and, and can you still make it through yeah. the processes? Awesome question. Um, so uh, our first form factor is in the form of a cold brew, ready to drink cold brew, right? So we're working on a black cold brew as well as a latte and a mocha. Um, and uh, the reason behind that being is that market's growing by 26% annually. Uh, it's still way smaller than, of course, the larger uh, grounds uh, or bean market. Uh, for us, it's great to jump into a growing segment uh, where there's been a lot of players entering the market so that we can actually uh, face off against them. But we think the ritual is extremely important, right? I actually had somebody challenge me because we said, hey, we feel like the ritual is important. We don't want to change your daily habits. And they said, why, why don't we just create a new category of, you know, different flavored caffeine beverages that get us going on our day and just, you know, skip coffee all together. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, and we're not interested in that either, right? What we want to do is give you the same experience you have every day. To do that, we have to create different form factors. One of them is the ready-to-drink beverage you're working on today. We're working on grounds, okay? So that's something that you then get to put in your espresso machine and get that same sort of crema buildup and the flavor from it. Turns out that for us to get a pour over requires a different ground because, you know, what you're missing is that gassing that, that happens in the bean once you've, and it generates the blooming. So there's different things that we have to work on, but we're going to tackle them all. So I want to first thank you, our panel. Uh, so give them a round of applause and talk. And we have a little special surprise. So, Mardon, for anybody that hasn't had a chance to taste Glyph, Mardon has a bottle here that's yeah, going to pop open for you. Thanks for coming like by. That. Last uh, session of the day, so come on. We've got to do yeah. a little bit of drinking. I have two <laughs> bottles. If you'd like to try it, just come on up here and have some cups. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, guys.